Before we start with the discussions, I thought I would sort of summarize where I think we are and a suggestion I have for where we uh, might go today. Um, what we have, what we voted on last time was what the work group did with me abstaining, was to uh, not suggest a bifurcated or a hybrid bar, but to keep the current bar structure and and perhaps make some suggestions to it. Uh, the other motion that was passed was to keep the independent boards that have been identified by the Supreme Court, or that would be our recommendation. Of course, the Supreme Court has created those, <laughs> and it was, would really be up to them to undo it. But the recommendation, uh, oh, and I forgot to mention that uh, Andrea was delayed in traffic, which is not surprising given that it's very long. And do you have a new one? And same with Eileen, uh, fairly. So they will both be arriving shortly. Um, so those were the two things we decided. I invited people to submit motions. Um, Eileen submitted three, and Dan submitted three. But my thinking is, before we actually get to the motions, um, I think some of them are sort of very particular, and I'm not sure that this body is necessarily the body to do the specific governance, the detailed governance, or the detailed cost centers. I think this group is to decide which what should be considered or thought about um, in light of Janice and Dental and other and to make recommendations to the court, which may be related to some of the motions that were made, or may be to, uh, like, um, a thought I had was a um, number of these, and I did hear from uh, Governor Dan Bridges, who asked that if we were going to be making sort of governance things, we should be, like, really talking to the Board of Governors, and that may be why I have uh, four governors in attendance and... Three in the room, three on the board. So I have seven. I have seven governors here. I realize you always have bar business pretty much almost every day, and you might be here for other reasons. But I'm thinking that we can make recommendations. But the recommendation would might be to the Supreme Court to work with the Board of Governors and a group, maybe from the appointed boards, to look at some of these issues. Or to make a recommendation that, well, maybe there needs to be more Supreme Court oversight in certain areas, more clear oversight, which would then insulate uh, challenges that might come under Janus. Or there might be uh, suggestions to look at cost centers, as Dan did in his third motion, and whether the court should come up with a separate fee if it was thought that those were not um, that those might be subject. Now, we did pass the one with the saying the six Supreme Court boards should continue. However, of course, if they sort of went into ideological areas, which they, to my knowledge, to date have not, that would then might raise a concern that we would say, well, there has to be some limitation on that so that we don't do exposure. So really, I am hoping that today... And I even said to Dory, do you think we could actually be done today? And I'm not sure. I mean, we might be able to, actually, if, if we're doing sort of the broad brush. Or we would come back on the 17th sort of with a written document that we might all agree or disagree, um, sort of tweak that, so that we would be in a position to say to the Supreme Court, looking at this, reviewing antitrust, reviewing Keller, reviewing these things, Okay, we feel like we've really educated ourselves, and now we're keeping the current system, and where are there areas that offer some exposure and, and suggestions we might have to limit that exposure? So we, so we sort of tie in more and not do as much detail, because I think that really has to be done by the Supreme Court and the Board of Governors and bar staff and perhaps interested entities. We had a message from PJ that came in uh, Friday afternoon when a lot of people had already uh, called it a day for the, uh, either had taken the whole day in some instances, or in my case, had taken part of the day. Um, 
so I'm not sure people have uh, thought that, and I'm not sure that it got posted, but it got sent to a few people um, suggesting um, different ways we might go uh, forward. So I just, I offer that as sort of a, um, good morning, good morning, come on in, uh, a thought, which I'll recap now uh, for Andrea and Eileen. Um, I suggested, good morning, I'm so happy you could be here. Uh, Jane and Mark are on the phone, just so you know. Um, I was suggesting, I recapped the two votes that we took that we were not, we're just going to keep the current system and make some tweaks to it, and that the Supreme Court Board's recommendation is that they continue uh, subject to being sure they're not doing anything ideological that would get us in trouble, that there'd be some awareness of that or consciousness. And then I'm suggesting rather than perhaps some of the detail, detailed that people are suggesting that we, with a more broader brush, make recommendations to the Supreme Court as to where there is uh, potential exposure or weaknesses for us to think about so that we would consider um, more oversight perhaps in some areas. But as far as governance and others, that that really we could say whether we think that there's some problems with governance or things that need to be done with governance, but rather than detailed recommendations to suggest perhaps if this is what the group wanted, that the Board of Governors and the Supreme Court and maybe the elected boards meet and talk about how we would move forward to be sure that we're protecting ourselves from the Janus and the uh, dental and other thing, Keller, things that might expose us. Would anyone else like to recap it differently or better than I just did? See, my voice is coming in. You can hear it. I'm not quite as squeaky. All right. So given that, uh, what are some thoughts that people have as to where we would go? Hunter. <coughs> well, um, first of all, I, I do agree that uh, I think our task, if possible, is to make some high-level recommendations to the court. Uh, I'm very pleased with the progress that was made at last meeting, the discussion that's taken place up to this point. I think in many ways, um, we've done a big part of what we were asked to do, which was take a, a, a good look and a deep dive on the Janus issue, um, and particularly with regard to the big picture structure of the bar. We now have our recommendation to the court um, with regard to that. So I think that's important. Um, I kind of view the rest of this as also important, but frankly, secondary to our initial big task. Um, and so I guess I would certainly agree that to the extent we're able to arrive at some um, big picture recommendations regarding some of these other secondary issues, if we can do that today, I, I would encourage us to do so. And then one point of clarification, I, I guess I'd always assumed that we would be preparing some sort of a written product for the court. Is that correct? I think that's the best way to be sure that we have captured and agreed to what we've captured as a group. So I think there is a written report. The question is whether we would come back as a in person and review it or whether we would do that through um, emails and other things. So that's something we could talk about. But I think based on um, everything we received, it would, be a, it would be an effort, but by the 17th, which is uh, nine days from now, uh, that we could try to pull something uh, or the, say the 15th, so you would look at it for two days, we could try to pull something together that then we could come back and wordsmith and be sure, kind of like take a final vote or see what the vote is on whatever that document says. Thank you. All right. Others? Andre. I agree with Hunter, and uh, thank you for synthesizing uh, where we have come from uh, Madam Chief Justice, uh, I... Still marry, but that's fine. <laughs> old I appreciate it. I kind of like the sound of it, but old I still like hard. Mary. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I don't know what to do with the motions before us at this point then. Um, well, I, don't feel, I feel that they've, they, they've been presented. They haven't actually been moved or seconded. Right. So in that sense, they're not before us. But I think some of them could be maybe broadened a little to be more 
uh, next steps that right. the Supreme Court should think about or areas um, um, that the court might want to further consider. I think some of Eileen's motions really is what this body was doing. Um, but I don't disagree that there, can, there needs to be continued vigilance and there might be need for uh, input. But, and I think Dan's are much more specific and um, could be brought in to say something like the court should look at, um, you know, like we have in essence right now a little like a moratorium on bylaws. Well, maybe it might be time to, to lift that moratorium or to say the uh, bylaws should be revisited, but with this body, with this group kind of all looking at it together through the lens of Janice and and the others, so what makes sense? Right. So, you know, governors might have one view from their perspective, members <laughs> or sections, others might have another view. Um, justices might have a view, and so, it, so I think having had the three governors on this work group and having some attend so many of the meetings, I think will help uh, future discussions so that we are sure that we're not, uh, that we are thinking about the public as um, my dear friend Kevin, who's come to every meeting and actually comes and watches us at the Supreme Court now. He's becoming a, a court junkie, I think, or at least I thought you were in the courtroom that day. That was to support 925. Oh, all right. All right, thank you. So not, not a regular, just a visiting for that day. Um, as we go forward. So, so, Andre, back to you. Yep. So uh, a, another piece to this is, well, let me back up. So Mark and I had talked about the fact that we hadn't addressed governance, and it sounds like we may arrive at a consensus that the governance piece and the bylaw considerations may be better served by a, a, a deeper dive within the bog itself. And I'm not objecting to that. Um, an, Another piece to this that we really haven't talked about is the, re the State Bar Act. Are we going to be more reactive than proactive here? Um, and if we are, are we making that recommendation to the court? Um, I also wanted to explore this independent audit examination situation that, that, that PJ had proposed because I think that's a, a great idea. Um, but I want to make sure that this isn't necessarily an extension of, of Pop Joy versus uh, New Mexico uh, State Bar. Um, I, I don't know how. Well, I know we can't do it, but 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 certainly th th these these holdings speak to whether or not uh, the engagement of activities by the bar are germane and. Uh, it, 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 within the regulatory context, if it, uh, it achieves regulatory goals and uh, improves the quality of legal services. Uh, that's a different rubric than looking at cost centers. So I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that if we make a recommendation that we're talking about two different things because a part of that is reconsideration, if any, of GR-12, and that seems to be what Eileen, um, some of her motion entails GR-12 rework or examination. So I just want to make sure that we have a two-track system rather than kind of an all-inclusive discussion regarding bylaws, cost centers, and now, again, the State Bar Act. So, so what, what would you put, how would you uh, title your two tracks? I mean, I, I heard everything you said, but I want right. to see if we can So the first track, it. the first track would be the considerations of GR-12 uh, in, in light of the regulatory, the regulatory objectives um, adopted by uh, the bar in 2017. Maybe there's a, Jan a Keller analysis for expansion of the deduction there. And then the second piece is the governance piece itself that attaches to um, additional oversight. It dovetails into antitrust issues. Um, but also, what are we going to do in the event of the repeal of the State Bar Act? I know that um, a lot of it is needs to be reworked on, on, within RCW 2648. Um, because of court cases, uh, because of bylaws. So all of that, I think, is, second, is a different track than the GR-12 analysis. 
that makes sense. Okay, comments? Other thoughts? Paul? So I largely agree with uh, most of what folks are saying. Um, I like the idea of respecting the existing structure, governance structure. I hear, you know, occasionally, oh, you know, that there's some governance issue. Um, I don't think there's any governance issue at the Washington State Bar Association. I think there have been um, challenges to governance at the Washington State Bar Association. Um, I think those challenges have sort of been uh, a reaction to uh, the efforts of some of us uh, to do what we viewed as reform and sort of kind of rebuild or sort of re get, get back to more of a balanced governance status. Uh, you know, we'd had an executive director for 15 years and things calcified a bit. And the idea of reform was really to kind of enhance transparency sort of to, to the extent there have been, you know, sort of calcification of uh, power to kind of break that up a bit and restore balanced governance. So uh, to the extent folks thought that looked uh, not very pretty from the outside, I can appreciate that, but that is what governance often looks like when it has to be sort of revisited. Um, so I like the idea of making, you know, I think the charter here is to look at these constitutional challenges, and we've, we've taken the step of deciding, you know, do we want to bifurcate or do we not want to bifurcate? I wholly support the ideas, you know, some of the ideas being floated around. I'd really like to hear Dan talk about his proposals. I'd like to hear Eileen talk about hers. Um, did Fred also propose something, or is it Mark, maybe? No, PJ, even, PJ has some proposals, well, maybe. He, he only sent those to the governors. Okay. Uh, so there's <clears> nothing, <throat> to my knowledge, and then sent something to uh, Dory and Tara. To the, did it go to the bar, bar structure work group? Okay. So I didn't look at the two line, uh, but uh, Fred and Mark did not submit anything okay. in writing. So I'd like to, you know, let those folks talk about their proposals. I'd like to, you know, keep talking about some of the ideas for avoiding challenges under Janus. I really like the idea of looking at uh, the Keller deduction and how we manage that in a way that's responsible and, and, and doesn't, you know, unnecessarily attract litigation. Uh, and then I think, uh, you know, to the extent there's uh, requests for bylaw amendments and so forth, I f uh, fully uh, welcome the lifting of the uh, moratorium on uh, bylaw amendments. I thought some of the amendments we were proposing were, would be very helpful to, toward what I want to do, which is sort of restore balanced governance, transparency, um, and, and uh, you know, checks and balances. Um, Certainly, always, you know, we do bylaw amendments with the Board of Governors. Those take six, nine months a lot of times. There's, uh, there's a first reading and a second reading and um, public input. I think that's the process we should go through. I think it's fine to suggest ideas, um, but I would really like to stick with the governance structure that's in place um, to the extent possible. Okay, others? Dan or Eileen, would you like to talk to your motions or your, or how they might be um, brought into or, or not, however you'd like? Um, Eileen, well, I'll go first. Okay. Yes. Thank I'm, you. Well, I did try to write these actually fairly broadly. Uh, I've, like all of us, probably given this a lot of thought, even since I sent those uh, motions in. And uh, I've talked to some former governors, looked at the cases, read all the comments. And, um, you know, this fall, I will have been a, a member of this bar association for 40 years. So uh, it's been a significant part of my life. And I appreciate the fact that for everyone here, I think these were significant issues that people wanted to do their best on to try and take care of an entity that's been so significant. 
But as this has gone on and we've gotten more information and comments, I, um, my recommendation, if it were mine alone, would be that the court should take, and I know you've said you don't want to disturb the governance structure, a significant look at what Hunter proposed. Um, and as you know, I was not on board with it at the beginning, but in looking at the materials, looking at the comments, um, looking at Dan's suggestions for improving things, and then looking at, I was just looking at the financials, um, the general fund was over a million dollars in the red four out of the last five years and was only in the black this last year, not because of cut expenses, but because revenues were up. And to me, that, that is a demonstration of a significant problem. And there needs to be an evaluation of what the bar is doing and how it can do it most effectively. And this group said it doesn't want to change certain entities. I think it was premature to take that motion without examining what the bar is doing what it should be doing and how it can most effectively spend its money. The, the treating, I mean, the members' dues, license fees, um, you know, it's, it's not an ATM. I, I, this is, was pretty astonishing to me. My motion, the first one, I'll just take the Keller issue. I think that GR12 is the underpinning of the bar, so if there are issues, with advocacy, there needs to be an examination of the underpinning to see if the GR12 in fact calls for those, and it does speak or say that the association should speak on behalf of the members. I think that does present a concern. And if the bar is engaging in activities that are not <laughs> supported by GR12, that is a different issue and another problem. So my uh, recommendation, and, and I think it is a, a terrible conflict of interest to ask bar staff to conduct this. Uh, they are aware that they're talking about their own jobs, their own co-workers, and it, uh, it is also, I think, would be more credible coming from someone outside the bar association. So my motion would be that the Keller examination be uh, the subject of an, and I don't care whether it's an individual or um, I believe Mr. Grabicki, if I've pronounced it correctly, has suggested a, a small group to examine the bar's activities both in light of GR12 and then what they are actually doing. I have uh, the original uh, spectrum of WSBA programs. I don't know that it would be particularly helpful to, to call out individual items. I think Dan has gone through and listed a number of areas that warrant closer uh, examination, but I would move that, as in my uh, motion that's in the materials, that there be an examination of the uh, of GR12 and the Keller deduction calculation done by outside person or persons <clears throat> and looked at particularly closely uh, in term in light of uh, some of Janice's language as to when there might be uh, ideological or speech Thank you. One question I have is whether we want to do the motions sort of in order or if you want to sort of have them out there and then at th sort of later in the meeting take them up if they have seconds and 
want to go forward because I'm not sure if we need to have more discussion of more motions and how things fit together. Um, I do want to do want to comment back though, Eileen. I, when I I guess I didn't when I was saying governance, I was thinking more the details, not that there wouldn't necessarily be changes because I think a group looking at it might make might suggest changes. Uh, some of the bylaws that were put in a moratorium changed things, and we the court had already adopted some, and then the and then realized that perhaps the current board wasn't supporting them, and then was sort of flummoxed, and then this came up about Janice and the others, so we just put everything kind of on hold. So I think there are many sort of moving parts to governance. So my I, my, I don't want my comments to be understood to be like, oh, we're not changing governance because clearly through this process there will be at least be discussion about it and then what recommendations are made or what the Supreme Court decides to do subsequent to these additional steps that are whatever the court decides to do based on the recommendations made by this group could be. So I, Paul might have heard me say, oh, yay, no change in governance, but actually Paul himself wants change in governance with some of the bylaws and things that uh, there's some of the board, governors are suggesting and other governors are not suggesting and so um, I just want to sort of say governance in the sense that we're not like redoing the bar or the current structure would continue until such time as the Supreme Court or the Board of Governors makes recommendations for something different well perhaps I misunderstood and was, was premature first I thought you wanted to get the motion resolutions out there, so oh, right. well, I wanted to have discussion of them. Okay, so so, um, so but I think we can. Is there a second to the motion, oh. to to Eileen's motion, at this time? Or we can take it up in a minute, Paul. Yeah, I just uh, I think it would be helpful to hear all of the ideas because I think there's some right. overlap and and um, you know I think there's a lot of good ideas that you know might be synthesized into slightly different resolutions at the end of the discussion right so I guess I was thinking that we because you made a motion then I did my follow-up question but I think if you w talk through yours and Dan talks through his and then if anyone else has other things that they think would kind of be a motion or be part of a motion then sort of toward halfway through the meeting maybe ish depending on how long that beginning part takes then we would try to um, see if we can come to some agreed upon motions and votes that then would guide a document that would come back for a consensus. So, so I understand the first one to be related to GR12 and the Keller deduction and having recognizing that it's difficult for, would be difficult for the bar and that we need to have more than just have new eyes looking at it. Or additional eyes looking at it. All right, you want to do your second one? So you want? Okay, that was my next question. If you don't mind. So and and I'm just sort of putting them out there and they're Correct. floating. All right. That's okay. <laughs> All right. We're you expand on what you said in writing. So if people have any questions about them, were there any questions about the first one? Is there? Sorry, I don't have my mic on. Yes. Were there any questions about the sort of the first one? Any clarifications or others? Recognizing that we'll come back to it and perhaps morph it into something else or not. Eileen, oh. is, Eileen, can you just state it succinctly? I think you explained it, but is there something you can just read? Uh, I move that. It's in your material. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, it is item in number the, one. To, right, it's item number one. And Dory did? Right. I, I used a, an alpha identification system because I noticed that Dan Clark had, in, had included some internal references using numbers, and I didn't want to confuse the issues. So when you see the motion that uh, Eileen just spoke to, it's identified in your materials as motion A. Yeah, I see it. Thank you. And it may, and it may be that it won't be that full motion, but that's what was in writing that was submitted. And so rather than try to make a more specific motion at this time, that was her original one, and then we'll see what we end up later. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. And so you'd like me then to go on to what would be item B, motion, motion B. B. All right. Yeah. Um, motion B. <coughs> should be in, yeah. Thank you. Let's see. Well, now I have to remind myself what I said. Janus, <laughs> it's yes. called the Janus Association, and again, is related to GR12. 
I have to say, I came back late last night from vacation, and I have a cold. So I, I'm, I'm re-engaging here. We're so happy you're here. Yeah. <laughs> so the what this is more less focused on the um, it's it's a, another piece of the Keller deduction. I mean, Keller says take out money that's spent on speech or advocacy. This is directed toward the association piece and an examination of the actual activities in which various bar groups engage. The uh, titles, I think, of in and of themselves are not necessarily a d complete description of the activities which various groups engage in. Uh, the sections, some of them, I spoke to one person after the meeting whose section very carefully avoids any requests for legislation or they have people with strong views on, I'm, she's not here so I'm not going to call her out, but they try and have a spot where folks who work on certain um, uh, issues can meet and discuss in a neutral fashion. Other sections have asked for legislation. So I don't think saying just sections would be a complete analysis. So there, I would suggest that, and I think that Hunter and Mark and I tried to set up a meeting with sections directors in which we would ask them to describe what activities they engage in, whether they do think any have implications for speech, and whether they see that as assisting in the process of their activities or if they would prefer to be free to speak and perhaps outside the state bar. So I think they could be very helpful in giving direction on not just what are they doing, but what would they like to do. The third is the Sherman Antitrust. I think we've Felt pretty. So you're going to motion C now. Motion C. Oh, Thank you don't you. want me to do that. No, I do, but I just oh. want to see if there are any questions or clarifications okay. on motion B. And uh, Jane and Mark, if you have anything, just do something so we know. <laughs> Rex will be able. I, Rex or Dory, I think, will be able to tell us. Okay. All right. All so right. then, motion C, the antitrust issue, which I think at the end of our uh, discussions we had felt fairly comfortable with in terms of the bar's activities, but that maybe to be a little more public about the process that the, or the oversight that the court has of the discipline process and other activities to avoid, <coughs> excuse me, any question that uh, there is, there is not appropriate oversight of what is otherwise impermissible state action. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I've now lost my uh, train of thought, to look at the RPCs, which are in effect a restriction on market activities. I think they're an appropriate one, but to again be clear about the process, process by which they were adopted excuse me, um, created and then are adopted and modified over the years. I can tell you the RPCs are rules, and so they are adopted by the Supreme Court on recommendations made by a committee. I actually <laughs> spent a very long time as a liaison to the uh, RPC committee when they did that full review when the new ABA model rules came out. So we can look at it, but anything that is a court rule, it doesn't mean the content doesn't need to be revisited, but the actual process of adopting that, that is clearly done by the Supreme Court. And, and I'm sorry, I should have said, and sure, the, um, the Sherman case said, it, it can't be just the process, but the substance. So that to show, particularly if there is any litigation, that there has been a credible and reasonable process undertaken to evaluate how the oversight is in place and perhaps to set up a, a routine every three or five years 
a thorough review to show that there is continued and energetic oversight by the court. And one more just fact is that uh, the ABA invites us to invite them to come do a review. Uh, they did that just last year. Uh, we declined this time because we were going through this process, but they do um, periodically come. They do a review. We set up, the bar sets up a committee. The Supreme Court sets up a committee. We review it. We see what we agree or disagree with. We then uh, compare notes, and the Supreme Court makes a final decision. But I think having it somewhere memorialized that that is the process or being on some sort of a regular schedule, I think, would help insulate. So. So any questions or clarifications on wh what is Motion C uh, made in writing by Eileen? Kyle. So I Eileen, all three of your motions envision an expert um, doing some kind of analysis I'm sorry. All three of your motions involve having an expert of some sort doing analysis or review. Do you have, and, and others have suggested maybe the, the Keller should be audited outside of the WSBA, and I tend to agree with that. I struggle with who might do that because the auditors generally, CPAs and whatnot, they don't have that background or expertise to be able to sort through those issues. Um, so my question to you is, do you have an idea of who those experts might be? Well, I, not having spoken to anyone, <laughs> I wouldn't want to name names now. I think uh, particularly on the First Amendment issue, there are folks who do First Amendment work, a lot of it's more Open Meetings Act, uh, but I think they could provide at minimum, you know, a line of Keller, post-Keller cases where issues have been raised, and Oregon went through a process and had to do a refund, which since it was 17 cents in a check mailed to everybody, just made everybody more angry, uh, but that, that there is a a line of cases that could be used. I didn't particularly want to get too specific. I think that, uh, one, it's very difficult for the bar to do it internally. I'm very conscious that the Board of Governors and all of us are, are volunteers, and particularly for people in solo practice or geographically, it, it is, a, this is going to be a big time commitment. So my thought is you would probably have two people at least, um, one on the law and one on the numbers. I mean, I looked at the cost centers. I did not find them particularly uh, helpful, but in one where I know the ATJ board and the Council on Public Defense were put together for expenditure of several hundred thousand dollars, but I know the Council on Public Defense's budget was less than 10000 so I think there needs to be somebody who can ask questions about how uh, entities have been clumped together and what the actual expenditures are in each area. But as to anybody specific right now, no, I have a concept of a kind of, ki kind of people, but not anything more than that. Next, Andrea, and then Andre. Eileen, I just, um, are you, can you hear me okay? Is that better? Eileen, I, I am curious as to whether or not um, in your review and analysis of the antitrust issues, if you considered or what kind of weight you gave to the suggestion that public members be a part of the Bar Association or if that was getting down into the specifics that you weren't ready to address. I, I tried to keep it kind of focused. I'm not sure if, the, I would want to see if there are other disciplinary boards that include public members and how they manage that. And I. I and I'm sorry, before you oh, sort okay. of go off a little bit, because I, I was speaking specifically in terms of the, the Board of Governors, in terms of that oh. antitrust piece. 
Oh, I see. With respect to market participants. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about the actual discipline process. No worries. No. That's why I wanted to clarify. We actually have public members both on the discipline board and the character and fitness board currently of the bar. So, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't really given that thought, and probably the first people I'd want to hear from would be current and former uh, governors about how they think it would, would work. Okay, uh, done, Andrea. Andrea, was that your question? Are you done? Okay, Andre, next. So, uh, in kind of looking at PJ's uh, recommendation with an independent audit, uh, you indicated maybe a two people. Would that include maybe a legal professional and a CPA, or maybe a group? Uh, for uh, of, of CPAs and a uh, a legal expert because it feels like they're going to butt up against um, some of the the case law with respect to germane activities and we've already taken a look at some of this and then I, I, another point and obviously we haven't dove as deep as an independent auditor would uh, but coming out with any recommendations. Uh, those are, it's kind of litigation risk analysis. I, I'm hearkening back to this. I think I can call it exposure now. Um, but it, 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 I'm just struggling with who would do this, who would they report to, what the timeline would be, um, and isn't it, Hasn't it already been done, right? I've got this Keller over, uh, deduction overview, calculation, and arbitration. Um, would that group interface with the Bar Association, with members that have, or the BOG, that have actually um, looked at this stuff and came out with the deduction for this year or last year? Um, because I, I feel that that mission creep into access to justice and diversity and inclusion and and the like uh, still feels present in the discussion and we had just voted to kind of keep those separate so um, I'm, I'm just really struggling as to know where we're going with that type of deep dive is it really about the money, lowering bar dues, or is it limiting exposure to lawsuit? Because um, at the end of the day, the regulatory uh, uh, rules that we have in place aren't for the benefit of the members. It's for the protection of the public. Um, and so reading the comments, it's, it's all well and good, but I think a lot of people are forgetting that um, the Supreme Court has put these regulatory uh, rules in place not for necessarily our benefit. We are intended or ancillary beneficiaries of this. Um, but it feels like we're, we're, we're angling towards, hey, I want to have an audit so we can reduce bought licensing fees in light of Janice or, and or Keller. And I, I'm just, I'd like to hear maybe from PJ as to what his thoughts are on what that, what that dive would be and what the overall outcome would be or the goal of the outcome. Well, uh, as I said at the beginning, I felt the motion was premature to say we are going to leave significant areas of the bar structure untouched, especially when they are a huge component of the bar's expenditures. That motion uh, passed, but as I understand it, and I think Fred Corbett said to me that the, uh, he did not feel that that motion precluded any analysis of the financial of the financials. The, uh, your comments were fairly sweeping, but myself, I don't find the current credit Keller deduction particularly credible amount in view of the, particularly some of the expenditures that Dan uh, listed in his motions. So I think, yes, it will require a, an expert on what would be characterized as speech. I think the bar engages in a fair number of things that would be characterized as speech. And then allocating or determining how much money is actually spent on them, because as I said also, I did not find the cost centers particularly persuasive when I looked at them. So you would need, I think, someone who knows the questions to ask 
and then someone who knows how to look at the money. And I don't know if um, uh, PJ. Uh, PJ or Mr. Grabicki, if 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 you want to, if he wants to say anything, or you want to ask him first, or well, let me have Andre do his follow up question, and then I'll see if PJ wants to. He doesn't have to, but if he'd like to, he's been very engaged uh, independently. <laughs> so, if 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 that analysis takes place and. The expert, the legal expert, concludes that these activities are germane to the regulation of the practice and, and improvement of legal services, then there won't be an analysis of the money. I, I, so I, I'm trying to, like, again, bifurcate if we're looking at money or risk exposure because it feels like we're really focusing on uh, an effort to reduce licensing fees. What we're looking at is trying to comply with Keller in a credible, transparent, and open way. Which may or may not result in reduction of some fees because sure. there's some concern that the $2, I don't know what it is right now, but the $2 or something, just seeing, of course, there are many, many members. So you divide it, so maybe it's not that small of number. But to date, it's been done in-house. Uh, it's been done in-house, and if there's been a challenge, which there was one year since I've only been chief a couple years, but to my knowledge, there have not been many challenges, but since I've been chief, there was one, and we referred it to an arbiter, Judge Downing, who reviewed it, who's not, not a, I don't know what his, his uh, financial background is, but I know his legal background is excellent, and reviewing it, he determined that the amount was correct, so he did not adjust it up or down. If he had, that would have happened. So I think part of our discussion here, so I don't think it's necessary. I understand you're making it an either-or, but I'm not sure it necessarily is an either-or okay. because I think we have to, being wanting to be compliant with Keller and wanting to limit our exposure to lawsuits challenging us under Keller or First Amendment, we want to have a robust discussion. And if anything, be a little higher then lower so that we're, we have some cushion mm -hmm. without, without, without doing it. But it's sort of like if it's close, well, let's include it versus if it's close, let's not include it and take our chances. Understood. Then having done that, I think, um, and all you have to do is have that ability to ask for it. Now, the multi I don't know, I can't remember how many people ask for it back, but it's a very minute number given the number of members. It's, it's not worth the, the $2, or they're fine with what the speech is, or you know, they just, they just want to practice law. Don't bother me with all this stuff. And um, so I think uh, it may... If it turns out that it, has, it should be higher currently and going into the future, that that will result not necessarily in a lesser license fee. You still have to pay whatever the license fee is. What it does is it gets you back some change uh, in response. Now, in my mind, you know, like if it was $10, that would not – some people would want it. $10 is, you know, the juror fee. But they uh, – but, but many people would just let that go by. Many firms would be just like, oh, have a nice day. We don't care. Or if they have enough attorneys, they might say, well, that's real money. We'll take it. Um, so so I guess that's my f finesse on the question. It's not an either or. It's an if then. Yes. Well, I think it's a do our due diligence. Be sure Keller is accurately assessed. The number so low that it just causes pause doesn't mean it's not accurately assessed. You could do the whole analysis and they say, well, gosh, it's actually 50 cents more than, it should only be $1.72, not $2.12. Oh, okay. But it could be, well, you know, there are things that are kind of on the margin and, you know, so maybe all of Northwest Lawyer gets subsumed into it versus two articles in Northwest Lawyer, for example. That might be a decision that would be made to be on, quote, the safe side. Uh, and as I said, I don't think it affects license fees, but it would affect an, uh, some dollar amount that could be refunded if people opt, wanted to have their Keller deduction back. Okay. PJ, did you wish to speak? I shall invite you. Recognizing I have not invited many others very often, so I... 
But since you were asked by a work group member to address it, I shall. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let, let me preface my remarks by saying that um, in the current Budget and Audit Committee, uh, one of the things that we're undertaking over the next year is the deep dive that you're talking about. Um, and that is going to happen. Um, with regard to um, where you should go from here, um, my idea was that you would form a working group and I would probably use some of the same people that were on the bar structures task force that predated um, this group, um, Ken Masters and Hugh Spitzer and Dan Bridges and some of the others. I'd get a group of about seven who are deeply invested in the bar, who understand the case law, and I would have them do the deep dive into the question of what activities of the Washington State Bar Association um, embody political or ideological um, speech and therefore could be offensive of um, the Janus decision. And I'd have them create a report that would go both to the Board of Governors and to the Supreme Court. Um, and once that um, uh, report was um, approved, reviewed and approved, then I would have the Washington State Bar Association um, uh, retain an outside public accounting firm with specific expertise in cost accounting and cost segregation. That's a specialization within accounting that exists. And uh, once you tell these people, here's the political and um, ideological activity, tell us what we're spending on it. Working with um, WSBA's accounting and financial staff, they'll be able to come up with a, with a number. Then when we are sued, and I expect we will be sued, we will have the expert testimony to defend what we're doing with the Keller deduction. I agree with what the ACLU said. The Keller exists and it's going to go on. We just need to figure out where we are. Now, we had this arbitration a couple of years ago, but we had a single uh, attorney challenging Keller. He had no horsepower. Um, in order to challenge Keller, you're going to have to come in with your own group of experts. And when we get our Keller challenge, it's going to come from the Goldwater Institute down in Arizona, and it's going to come from those that group of uh, Virginia lawyers. And they have the, the money and the horsepower to bring in um, their own auditors, their own cost segregation people to attack us. And we're going to have to be prepared for that. So that's, that's how I would go about doing this. And I, I would treat that as a friendly amendment, although I think you uh, have to there would have to be discussion about who's on this work group. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Other comments, thoughts, questions? Andre. So, so I thank you for that because that makes it crystal clear in my mind, not that I'm the be-all, end-all of this thing, but certainly that puts it in the appropriate places and and provides a format for uh, to move forward. So... Uh, Notwithstanding Eileen's motion, it, if we could rephrase maybe PJ's comments, and uh, I, I'd be willing to second that that type of a motion. Yeah, I'm still not taking seconds, but this is why I thought it would be helpful to have the discussion, so things might more for shift as we have more insights and thoughts. Uh, anything else on Eileen's three motions? Otherwise, I'd like to move to Dan's. I, I would, just, Eileen, please. I just I want to point out that. I include General Rule 12, and I think it does need to be included specifically in any uh, review in terms what? of, of uh, PJ's nodding, of whether it calls for speech. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, you have sort of two things. One is you have your first motion, which dealt with GR 12, and then you have it as it relates to speech and Keller. Or are you subsuming it in it now? Well, no, I just wanted to make sure. They're both called out right. uh, specifically, and that I think PJ's nodding that, that he also was including that. He just didn't address it specifically. Correct. Yep. Thank you. All right. Dan, are you going to speak to yours? Uh, will uh, you? Uh, uh, sure. I'll, I'll, um, um, okay, so I had thought... We had said the last time we met that we were going to talk about the, we're going to dive into this, and so that's why I made the, those uh, um, three. I think uh, um, e, e and F kind of uh, a tie into uh, A, A and B. Okay, with hers, 
and um, they're just more deeper dives, I, I think. Um, uh, D, um, I, I, I certainly um, I do, do support. Um, I really support too that that the court they lift uh, okay their ban on us the bog. I mean we certainly there's there's several things that we've seen this last nine months that we need to look to uh, tweak in, in our our um, our bylaws. But but I mean right now we can't. So um, uh, um, yeah yeah that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, I do want to clarify. I did suggest, I did say we were going to do governance, and then the more I thought about it and I saw the motions, then I thought, whoa, oh, this might be more than we can, <laughs> more than we might be able to do. So, um, if it's all right, Dan, since I'm not sure everyone, well, I guess, does, is everyone familiar with Dan's three motions, D, E, and F? Did everyone look at the materials? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't make it. I don't know if it's my iPad. I, I did read them, but I, I can't make it come up now. The little link doesn't seem to be working. Am I doing something wrong? Do you, does anybody have a I paper had some trouble on uh, Friday, but then I was able to get it. My assistant was able to help me. Oh. Why don't I, can I just read the three yeah, motions? Sure. Uh, Dan has a lot of um, comment that's added to it as supporting it and explaining it. But motion D was uh, regarding increasing the length of service of governors from three to four years and recommending the Supreme Court amend or allow the Board of Governors to amend the bylaws regarding permitting current or former governors and WSBA presidents to serve additional terms. Um, and his actual motion was B to uh, recommend to the Supreme Court that the term of governors that are elected to the Board of Governors be changed from three to four years that the current bylaws that limit service of a member on the BOG to no more than one 36-month term be eliminated, and that the current bylaws be either allowed to be changed by the current Board of Governors and or be ordered changed by the Supreme Court to allow for members to serve more than one term on the Board of Governors and to allow for prior members that have served on the Board of Governors and or in the WSBA presidency role to be eligible for future service if elected or appointed to the Board of Governors. Okay, uh, motion E was regarding recommendation of the work group <coughs> that the Northwest lawyer become an opt-out requirement of membership, that it be budget neutral, not funded by member license fees, that its content be requested to focus more on substantive legal issues and case law review and less on controversial social and political content, and that the name be potentially changed to better reflect the three current legal license types of the WSBA. Um, there were six, uh, there, the motion contained six parts. Uh, one was that we recommend the Supreme Court look to establish overall review and decision-making authority of accepted content of the editorial process of the Northwest Lawyer. That we recommend to the Washington Supreme Court that the WSBA Budget Cost Center for Northwest Lawyer be budget neutral so that my, member license fees not be used to subsidize operations of Northwest Lawyer. That the funding, number three, that the funding for Northwest Lawyer that is needed that is not met through sales of advertisement revenue be funded through adoption of an operational Northwest Lawyer fee paid by members that want the magazine. Four, that if motion item number three is not adopted, that the Supreme Court look to establish an opt-out provision in the license fee to allow for members that did not wish to subscribe to Northwest Lawyer to be able to opt out of payment of license fees similar to that of the Keller deduction. Five, that to try to reduce potential for Fleck and Oregon and Texas type potential litigations against the WSBA, that a recommendation be made to Northwest Lawyer staff that the content of Northwest Lawyer be solely focused on practice of the law and or relevant case law review and changes to Washington and federal law and less on opinions and or stances of controversial issues where opposing viewpoints could likely lead to increased risk of litigation. And six, that Northwest Lawyer look to potentially change the current name of Northwest Lay Lawyer to some alternative name to better recognize the three current license types of WSBA members and to prevent confusion with Oregon and Idaho's bar magazines. And then motion F was regarding proposed establishment of a Supreme Court fee in lieu of current member license fees to fund various cost centers of the WSBA. And Dan outlined um, eight cost centers that uh, he thought could be subject to attack 
under the First Amendment. And then his motion has three parts. One is that we recommend the Washington Supreme Court look to potentially order through court order a new proposed mandatory fee similar to the Client Protection Fund that is applicable to all licensed members to pay to attempt to fund some or all of the above described cost centers and important WSBA functions. Two, that if the Supreme Court does so, that a correlating reduction in mandatory member license fees be made to the overall impact on WSBA members cost neutral. The Supreme Court does the correlating reduction be made. Okay, cost neutral. Okay, and three, that if this mandatory fee is adopted, that the order be recommended to be annually reviewed for reasonableness to ensure that adequate funding of those programs remain in order to provide continued important robust services to the public and to the WSBA membership that serves the public. Okay. So questions for Dan on any of those motions or comments, thoughts? I have a question. Yes, Jane. On, um, since I'm not a bar member and I'm not real familiar with the rules, are there uh, procedures on how to remove a BOG member that are not real cumbersome or or I'm sure they must have some rules, but uh, what is that process? Uh, uh, Paul? Going from memory, I believe um, that it is a, and correct me if I'm wrong, a 70% vote, 75% vote of the sitting BOG members must vote to remove a BOG member. Uh, Rajiv, if you have something to add, go to the microphone, please. Our president-elect, Rajiv. Uh, there's two processes, and I appreciate that. There's one for the Board of uh, Governors to remove a uh, governor, but there's also a process by which the members can also remove a governor. Um, so there's two accountability methods, one by the membership itself and one by the Board of Governors. And do you recall what the members have to do to successfully remove a BOG member? It is similar to the referendum procedure, but in the case of district governors, it's just the members of their district, I believe. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, Jane or Mark? Has Fred joined us? No. Okay. Um, Andrea, please. Not questions just yet. Um, Dan, first of all, I thank you so much for the manner in which you put together your motions. I really appreciated the motion itself and then the context in terms of the support. Um, so that's my first thought. My second thought that I wanted to share, and it's kind of related to um, Eileen's motion with respect to the Keller um, issue, I I look at the, the numbers that you um, set forth with the various programs. And my heart palpitates because I'm thinking like this is, irrespective of the rationale or legitimacy of it, that this is the crux. This, this, this is sort of like why some individuals are so upset and contentious because they look and they see um, the programming, and it's very the title itself in, invokes the nature of the issue: diversity, access to justice, um, the, the 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 newsletter, and so it, I'm, I'm appreciative of us having this open discussion without having votes on motions just yet, because it allows us to kind of put all the information together. I. Your numbers, looking at the, the way that you put the numbers together, helped me in terms of um, understanding what I think I would be comfortable with. And so I'm like, I always say I, I'm the test baby. If I get it, then anybody can get it, okay? So we have to make it really elementary. And what I'm saying is that I absolutely agree at this point with having a not just a robust discussion, but a robust process by which it can be very clear how that Keller determination is made so that we can have an appropriate response. Because, again, looking at the comments, looking at the language of the lawsuits, looking at what is under attack, that's it. That's what 
needs to be defended. I don't care whether we call it risk analysis or whether we call it, I don't care what name we give to it in terms of <laughs> in terms of that. But the bottom line is that those are the programmings that are under attack. I think that to the extent that Keller, we can put into substance and process something around that that makes it very clear how we get to that number, I, I would be on board with that and I would be ready to second any motion and vote in support of that. So those are just my preliminary comments. My other thing, my other, if I could just Please, a little bit more. of course. Um, Separately, so they're kind of combined. Um, I'm not sure how much we will get to the governance discussion, but I do believe that that's a pertinent discussion that we need to have. And I'm linking the two because I'm aware of some changes that were made or suggested to the bylaws to kind of address issues of diversity and address issues of public inclusion. And that some of those bylaws, um, in fact, the, the public, uh, in, the inclusion of public members was one of the bylaws that was contentious and not supported by a number, a member, a, a number of the current um, Board of Governors. And that was in fact, the, the rule had come down, but they were the current bug, bog was just simply not complying with the rule to allow for the public members to be placed on the current board. And then we got this, the, the, the sort of the moratorium, so that this process could take place. I'm also aware of um, that there were some proposed changes around how the at-large positions. We're going to be um, we're going to be filled. How those seats were going to be filled, and again, those large at large positions are specifically so that we can have diverse representation sitting on the board of governors. So I, I'm linking those things because I'm thinking about what's under attack, and I'm also, I'm just I'm not to be candid. No disrespect, I am not comfortable yet in trusting that those issues will be appropriately and adequately resolved if we just say, give it back to the, the current Board of Governors. Uh, Paul. Thank you, Andrea. I just wanted to uh, touch on some of those issues since I'm one of the Board of Governors that has uh, voted on some of those issues and proposed some of those changes. Uh, I'm going to take the second one first. There was a lot of misunderstanding uh, out there, and I think some of it was uh, conflated intentionally around our suggested amendments to how the current at-large positions would be um, elected. The goal that we had in mind for the at-large positions was merely that the same types of folks would be elected and not appointed. Um, in my experience and in my observation, um, it has been better to have members elected to the Board of Governors rather than appointed. And this again goes back to a comment I made earlier that I won't dig too deeply into, but the sort of calcification of governance and leadership that occurred over a 15-year period had to do, in my view, in the view of others, with, in part, appointing positions and the loyalties and the conflicts that those appointments can create um, just logically. When folks are elected by a diverse group of folks, there's no loyalties. they are diverse loyalties. Um, and that is also related to the first issue that you raised, Andrea, regarding the three additional seats. I think, uh, you know, others can take a view about whether or not, you know, we need public representation, you know, how much triple LT representation should be on the board. Um, one issue that was, you know, of interest to many of us was, you know, there's 23 triple LTs. And the idea that 23 people would get a seat on the board commensurate with the next smallest cohort being 
thousands was a little bit out of whack. Uh, Nancy is giving me some signals. 30? Okay, now we're up to 40. At the time, we were 20 or 30 or something. But again, that pales by comparison to the smallest geographic district, which I don't know who that would be. Dan, how many, how many, represent, how many folks do you represent? 1,000? 1,200. So that was one issue. So um, the issues, again, with those three new seats were that these would be three more appointed seats. That was one key issue. And another key issue was uh, that many of us did not see the rationale at that point for having public members or having a triple LT member. But there was nothing about any of those efforts that should be viewed as or characterized as attacking efforts for diversity or inclusion or access to justice. A lot of this really went down, boiled down to fundamental concerns about the governance of the bar and resetting that governance to greater transparency, uh, more representative governance, and more balanced governance and leadership. Um, Andre, I'm just looking for other hands, but Andre, please. Here I go again. Uh, Andrea, I thank you for succinctly stating your concerns here because I share them. I also have a strong concern about this idea that the Board of Governors res, uh, represents con a constituency. Dan's duty of loyalty and duty of care is to the Bar Association itself, not to his constituency. And so when we're talking about at-large members that are appointed instead of elected, um, I, I think I don't want to say you're conflating the issue, but to say that 40 uh, triple LT shouldn't have a seat at the table, I think is somewhat disingenuous. Um, they, they should have a seat at the table. Um, so th this, this, this I, I see a turf war, that, ha and we're kind of on the backside of that turf war now. But the Board of Governors has a duty of loyalty and obedience to the WSBA, not to their constituents. And I hearken back to GR12, and, and uh, one of the regulatory objectives is protection of the public. It, it, it's not about protection of the attorneys. We're, we're ancillary or unintended beneficiaries of some of the programming. And I think there's a rub there when, when I hear reform and things of that nature because what are we reforming to? Transparency so the lawyers are controlling or the BOG is controlling more of the activities of the Bar Association so it's fuel to the benefit of the members? And so, I, and that's not an indictment on you for sure, but, but, but that feels as if that's kind of the, when Miss Littlewood was terminated, it was under the guise that we're taking a new direction. I still haven't heard the new direction that we're, we're going in, but it seems to suggest that that new direction is more advocacy or a voice or cost controls regarding licensing fees to benefit the members. Can I just respond to that quickly? After I ask a question, uh, Andre, when you say represent the Washington State Bar Association, will you define what what Washington State Bar Association is that? All the licensed members, is that the organization that, that supports? So I just want you to be clear in your definition. Understood. So I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the mic. Coming back with the mic on. Uh, so I'm looking at the, uh, under common law, the duty of care. All of this uh, information uh, uh, came about within the task force recommendation. And so when I'm looking at the, the, the WSBA, the WSBA itself is a Supreme Court entity or it's a creation of the State Bar Act. So the fidelity is to the Supreme Court, not to the members and the licensees. And so if I hope I'm answering your question with respect to that common law duty of care and obedience. Uh, I'm going to let Paul respond, and then I'm going to go to Andrea next after that. Um, I do not want to get back into a back and forth, so I'd like to 
uh, to the extent you're commenting or clarifying, but um, so Paul, I'll start with you and then I'll go to Andrea. So, I mean, the last thing I want to do is imply that lawyers serving on the Board of Governors are just serving the interests of lawyers. Um, I have never really ever met someone who's served currently on the Board of Governors or served in the past on the Board of Governors said, you know, I'm just really out for the lawyers here. This is my gig. I'm just really watching out for the lawyers. I think every person who's ever run for the Board of Governors, every person who sat on the Board of Governors sat on it for in the interest of serving all of the, the interests that the, the Bar Association serves, protection of the public from lawyer misconduct, uh, access to justice, improvement in the administration and the quality of justice, justice, improving the quality of the legal profession. Frankly, it's a little, to me, a little bit obvious that lawyers on the front lines of these things probably know the most about it. Now, that's not to say that members of the public certainly shouldn't have access to an input to the Bar Association and that our activities shouldn't be scrutinized. I think the Washington State Bar Association does a, and has for a long time, done a very good job, for example, of lawyer discipline. I think that the, the boards that the court has set up um, to extend the uh, activities of the Bar Association or to handle certain aspects of access to justice and, and, and uh, diversity uh, that are more appropriately done under under boards under this court's supervision have been very well thought out and well executed. But um, the idea that the current, the, the, the idea that the current structure itself is not working, I think it's a reflection of the fact that it wasn't working for years and going in to fix it and restore it was challenging and not pretty. Boards of members of the Board of Governors previously, in recent years, if they asked for documents, sometimes were not given those records. I mean, there was a certain amount of power and opaqueness to the system that needed to be fixed. So, uh, you know, I think that the governance of the bar is actually in pretty good shape. It, it needs to be fine tuned with some of the amendments we proposed. I'm all ears about other amendments. But I don't think it needs to be wholesale revisited. Uh, Andrea. Thank you. Um, just a, a, a few thoughts. Again, I'm I'm not sure we'll, where we'll conclude with the, when conclude with this. But again, to the extent that this is the forum, then I'm just sort of maximizing the opportunity to make sure I raise these issues. Um, I think, just for clarification, the fidelity to the Bar Association, the, it, it's t t the mission to serve the public. I remember when I was initially appointed, so I am one of your appointed people, but for my appointment, perhaps I would not be, I would not have been on the Board of Governors, and but for that, I perhaps would not be seated at this table today. So um, I think there's merit in having individuals appointed. And in fact, I recall my interview when it took place out in Moses Lake. I was asked by a sitting uh, BOG member at the time um, whether or not I had heard the discussion about the mission statement and whether or not I agreed with the sentiment that or with the priority of public, serving the public coming first in the mission statement. And I recall specifically saying, yes, I heard that discussion. In fact, I went back to read my materials, my, my statement that I submitted for purposes of being in the, as part of this process. And I referenced twice in there service to the public, and I put that first. And I think that sometimes we sort of construct this arbitrary or senseless binary and in reality, in service to the pub public, that is how we serve the lawyers, because we have an obligation to ensure that lawyers are competent, we are ethical, and so forth. And, that, and, and the priority is to make sure that we're doing that for the vulnerable individuals who are members of the public, seeking legal services for things that are so <laughs> intimate and emotional and, 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 and traumatic. So that is why we have that obligation. I think it is absolutely ironic to suggest that we have that 
unique responsibility and that critical responsibility, but then at the same time, in the same breath, to say, but yet the people that we serve cannot be seated at the table with us. I think that's fundamentally problematic. To suggest that the discussions around not including members of the public had to do with representation and and so forth, I, it, th those things are contradictory. It's precisely for reasons of diversity, representation, accountability, transparency, inclusion, that you want to have members of the public be a part of the board, that you want to have the other members who are licensed to practice in the state of Washington, such as triple LTs and LPOs seated also at this board. So they also have a voice. So they can also hold lawyers and other individuals accountable as well. So again, not drawing any conclusions, but because this is the forum, I think, it, and hopefully we'll get to that part, that's why I, those things are, are critical. I am compelled to say, again, I am uncomfortable leaving certain things decided by the current Board of Governors. I too was attending the meetings where there is discussion of the new direction. I don't know what the new direction is. I am not afraid of change. We welcome change, but change should be good. Change should improve processes. Change should make things better. What I have seen is that we did have a dismissal of an ED for which current members of the Board of Governors expressed that they themselves were not aware of what the basis of that dismissal was. We had meetings wherein staff members valued staff members who were hushed or their comments responded to very grossly inappropriately where, and I don't know if this work group is aware of it, but you have incredible talent that has been at the Bar Association for a very long time that is now no longer here. And it's a direct result of the chaos and the, and the unprofessionalism and the hostile environment that they felt here. A great, wonderful talent that is no longer here. You had meetings taking place where people were very comfortable using racialized language. So uh, it, it, there's also the lack of diversity training. And then in that context, you also then had these discussions about these purported changes to how the at-large positions were going to be elected and then the refusal to implement the rule change with respect to the addition of public members. So within that context then, I'm asked to evaluate the new direction. <laughs> So I'm concerned with entrusting or leaving unanswered part of our task with respect to looking at governance. Thank you. Others, comments? Hunter. Well, first of all, Andrea, you, you just said something that I think was really interesting for me, um, which is that you know for, for some time I, I have... I think also rejected this idea that it's an either or proposition that you serve the public or the members. And, and I, I had argued for quite a while that you serve the public, that through serving the members, you do serve the public. You just turned it on its head, which I think is really interesting. I'm going to have to be thinking about that for a while, that by serving the public, um, you in fact serve the members. So thank you for that. Um, I had some other additional thoughts on the conversation that have happened, but I think I'm going to hold on to those until potentially later on, maybe discuss um, during our, our off, uh, during the time when we're off the record. The other point I wanted to say is that it, it strikes me as we're going forward and as I'm thinking about this product that we're going to prepare for the court, um, that Dan's motions, of which I agree with um, lots of, of many parts of them. But it strikes me that I think D and E are, are maybe a little more detailed in this high level view of, of what we're, of what I would propose we're trying to get to the court. Whereas I think F is pretty closely related to um, Eileen's proposals in, in, in many regards, A, B, and C. Um, so I'm thinking about, about that in the second half of our, of our meeting this morning. I'm wondering if um, we might consider um, aiming toward further discussion of, of those uh, with our last bit of time here together this morning. Thank you. Okay. Andre, we have two minutes and then we're going to have a break. Or when Andre's done talking, we'll have a break. Two points. First, first Andrea, preach. Thank you. The second <laughs> is in looking at Dan's uh, motion F, the 1.8 million divided by 45,000 equals $41. That's the wrong number, 
40,000. 40,000? Okay, yeah. I'll have to redo my math, but that may take it to yeah. about a $50. Yeah. Do you have that number? Is it about 50 bucks that, that we'd be looking at? Around there, yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to con conceptualize that as we draw this out further. Thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, I'll let you have the last word sure. before break. So one point to make um, is that last summer uh, the BOG had um, convened a, uh, a, a we, we met as um, with uh, Alec and um, okay, um, uh, we did some structure work group to look at the 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 um one spots the um three spots we had and we had met all all summer we came up with um i mean some final i mean uh, uh, okay some final thing to look at and then you and, and then you uh, you uh, uh, okay Okay, and then your mandate came down. So we couldn't, I mean, take action. Um, I think it's, uh, the BOG should be allowed to look at this. Um, one of the points that I would make, though, with the three new seats, they were adopted, but the work group for 2014 said to, if you were to adopt those three seats, you, you should look at um, overall size. And that bog failed to um, I mean, do so. So I had spent a lot of uh, time on size of the bog and actually come up with the ideal size for most reports. And is um 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 is um one five is the maximum size. And so that was one of the, the issues that we're we're um, with right now. So if we are going to you know look to onboard those um, um, spots when I think we need to look at the overall size um, okay so if you. I could just um, restate it and make sure I understood everything which was last summer the Board of Governors was meeting and was talking about uh, the positions uh, came up with some recommendations but before uh, they came forward we put down the, the Supreme Court put down the moratorium and that you've been looking at or have looked at optimal size of boards and that 15 would be the, the most and uh, that you think that the Board of Governors should have the opportunity uh, to at least weigh in on this. So, and, and a recommend, period, that's the end of you. And then I would say a recommendation might say we think this is something the Supreme Court and the Board of Governors should look at. So you could have that as something that might go forward um, and I think when we come back we're going to take a break now uh, we should think about the state bar talk about the state bar act too because the state bar act uh, the Supreme Court through Kate well, I'll say all this when I come back so let's take a break from uh, now until 1047 <laughs> 